Charlemagne is the real prince of enchantments and the world of fairy. His reign is like a solemn and brilliant pause between barbarism and the Middle Ages, while he himself is a grand and majestic apparition, recalling the magical pageant of Solomon's sway. He is at once a resurrection and a prophecy. In him the Roman Empire, overleaping Frankish and Gaulish origins, reappeared in all its splendor. In him also, as in a symbol, evoked and manifested by divination, there is delineated beforehand the perfect empire of the ages of mature civilization, the empire crowned by priesthood and establishing its throne beside the altar. The era of chivalry and the marvelous epos of romances begin with Charlemagne. The chronicles of his period are like the four sons of Amon, or Oberon, king of fairy. Birds utter speech and direct the French army when the path has been lost in the forest. Brazen colossi appear in mid-ocean and indicate to the emperor a free way eastward. Roland, first of the paladins, wields a magic sword, baptized like any Christian and bearing the name of Durandal. The hero addresses this sword, which seems to understand him, and nothing can resist its supernatural onset. Roland has also an ivory horn, contrived so skillfully that the lightest breath wakens a response within it, and that answer is heard for twenty leagues around, causing even mountains to quiver. When the paladin falls at Roncesvalles, overwhelmed rather than conquered, even then he uprises like a giant beneath some avalanche of trees and rolling rocks. He winds his horn, and the Saracens take refuge in flight. Charlemagne, at a distance of more than ten leagues, hears the signal and would speed to his aid, but he is prevented by the traitor Ganelon, who has sold the French army to the barbaric horde. Finding himself abandoned, Roland for the last time embraces his Durandal, and then, summoning all his strength, strikes it with both hands against a mountain block, hoping to shatter the weapon, lest it fall into the hands of infidels. But the block itself is cloven, the sword is not even indented. Here at Roland clasps it to his breast and yields up his spirit with so high and proud a mien that the Saracens do not dare to approach, but, still shaking, direct a cloud of arrows against their conqueror, who is no more. To be brief, Charlemagne, bestowing a throne upon the papacy and receiving from its hands the empire of the world in return, is the most imposing of all personalities in French history. We have spoken of the Enchiridion, that minute work which combines the most secret symbols of the Kabbalah with the most beautiful Christian prayers. Occult tradition attributes its composition to Leo III and affirms that it was presented by this pontiff to Charlemagne, as the most precious of all offerings. Any king who owned it and knew how to use it worthily could become master of the world. This tradition is not perhaps to be cast aside lightly. It assumes, 1, the existence of a primitive and universal revelation, explaining all secrets of nature and harmonizing them with the mysteries of grace, conciliating reason with faith, since both are daughters of God and concur to illuminate intelligence by their double life. 2, the necessity, which imposes itself, of concealing this revelation from the multitude lest the same be abused by those who do not understand it, and lest they turn against faith not only the power of reason but that of faith itself, to the confusion of reason, which is never too well within the comprehension of the vulgar. 3. The existence of a secret tradition, reserving the knowledge of these mysteries for the sovereign priesthood and the temporal masters of the world. 4. The perpetuity of certain signs or panticles, expressing the said mysteries in a hieroglyphical manner which is understood only by adepts. The Enchiridion, from this point of view, should be regarded as a collection of allegorical prayers and its secret Kabbalistic panticles are keys thereto. Some of the chief figures may be described as follows. The first, which appears on the cover of the work itself, represents a reversed equilateral triangle inscribed within a double circle. The two words, which are written within the triangle in the form of a cross, are Elohim and Sabot, meaning the God of Armies the equilibrium of natural forces and the harmony of numbers. On the three sides of the triangle are the three great names, Jehovah, Adonai, Agla. Above the name of Jehovah is the Latin word formatio. Above that of Adonai is reformatio, and above Agla is transformatio. Thus creation is ascribed to the Father, redemption or reform to the Son and sanctification or transmutation to the Holy Spirit, in consonance with the mathematical laws of action, reaction and equilibrium. Furthermore, Jehovah is to be understood as the genesis and formation of dogma in accordance with the elementary significance of the four letters comprised in the sacred tetragram. Adonai is the realization of this dogma in human form, that is to say, in the Lord manifest, who is son of God or perfect man, 
and agla, as we have explained fully elsewhere, expresses the synthesis of all dogma and all Kabbalistic science, seeing that the hieroglyphics of which this name is formed exhibit in a clear manner the triple secret of the great work. The second pantacle is a head, having three faces, crowned by a tiara and issuing from a vessel filled with water. Those who are initiated into the mysteries of the Zohar will understand the allegory which is presented by this head. The third pantacle is the double triangle, known as the Star of Solomon. The fourth is the magical sword, bearing the device, Deo Duce, Comite Pharaoh. It is an emblem of the great arcanum and the omnipotence of the adept. The fifth is the problem of the human form attributed to the Savior, as resolved by the number 40. It is the theological number of the Sephiroth multiplied by that of natural realities. The sixth is the pantacle of the Spirit, represented by bones, duplicating the letter E and the mystic Tau, or T. The seventh and most important is the great magical monogram, interpreting the keys of Solomon, the tetragram, the sign of the liberum, and the master word of adeptship. This pantacle is read by its revolution wheelwise and is pronounced rota, taro or torah. The letter A is frequently replaced in this seal by the number 1, which is its equivalent. The pantacle in question contains also the form and value of the four hieroglyphical emblems of the tarot suits, being the wand, cup, sword and denier. These elementary hieroglyphics recur everywhere on the sacred monuments of Egypt, while Homer also depicts them on the shield of Achilles placing them in the same order as the author of the Enchiridion. The proofs of these explanations, if offered in the present place, would divert us from our immediate subject and would moreover demand a special study which we hope to undertake and make public at some future time. The magical sword or dagger depicted in the Enchiridion seems to have been the particular symbol of the secret tribunal, or company of free judges. It is in the form of a cross and is concealed or enveloped by the device which surrounds it. God alone wields it, and he who strikes therewith is responsible to none for his actions. As such, it is terrible in its menace and so also in its privilege. We know that the Vemic dagger smote in the dark those who were guilty, their crime itself often remaining unknown. What are the facts respecting this appalling justice? The answer involves an excursion into realms of shadow which history has failed to enlighten and recourse to traditions and legends for light which science cannot give. The free judges were a secret association opposed, but in the interests of order and of government, to anarchic and revolutionary societies which were secret in like manner. We know that superstitions die hard and that degenerated Druidism had struck its roots deeply in the savage lands of the North. The recurring insurrections of Saxons testified to a fanaticism which was, a, always turbulent, and, b, incapable of repression by moral force alone. All defeated forms of worship, Roman paganism, Germanic idolatry, Jewish rancor conspired against victorious Christianity. Nocturnal assemblies took place. Thereat the conspirators cemented their alliance with the blood of human victims. And a pantheistic idol of monstrous form, with the horns of a goat, presided over festivals which might be called agapai of hatred. In a word, the Sabbath was still celebrated in every forest and wild of yet unreclaimed provinces. The adepts who attended them were masked and otherwise unrecognizable. The assemblies extinguished their lights and broke up before daybreak. The guilty were to be found everywhere, and they could be brought to book nowhere. It came about therefore that Charlemagne determined to fight them with their own weapons. In those days, moreover, feudal tyrants were in league with sectarians against lawful authority. Female sorcerers were attached to castles as courtesans. Bandits who frequented the Sabbaths divided with nobles the blood-stained loot of rapine. Feudal courts were at the command of the highest bidder, and the public burdens weighed with all their force only on the weak and poor. The evil was at its height in Westphalia, and faithful agents were dispatched thither by Charlemagne entrusted with a secret mission. Whatsoever energy remained among the oppressed, whosoever still loved justice, whether among the people or among the nobility, were drawn by these emissaries together bound by pledges and vigilance in common. To the initiates thus incorporated they made known the full powers which they carried from the emperor himself, and they proceeded to institute the tribunal of free judges. They were a kind of secret police, having the right of life and death. The mystery which surrounded their judgments, the swiftness of their executions, helped to impress the imagination of people still in barbarism. The holy vem assumed gigantic proportions. Men shuddered in describing apparitions of masked persons, of summonses nailed to the doors of nobles in the very midst of their watchguards and their orgies, 
of brigand chiefs found dead with the terrible cruciform dagger in their breasts and on the scroll attached thereto an extract from the sentence of the holy Vem. The tribunal affected most fantastic forms of procedure. The guilty person, cited to appear at some discredited cross road, was taken to the assembly by a man clothed in black, who bandaged his eyes and led him forward in silence. This occurred invariably at some unseemly hour of the night, for judgment was never pronounced except at midnight. The criminal was carried into a vast underground vault, where he was questioned by one voice. The hoodwink was removed, the vault was illuminated in all its depth and height, and the free judges sat masked and wearing black vestures. The sentences were not capital invariably, for those who judged were familiar with the circumstances of the crime though nothing transpired concerning them, as death would have overtaken the revealer instantly. Sometimes these formidable assemblies were so crowded that they were comparable to an army of avengers. One night the emperor himself presided over the secret tribunal, and more than 1,000 free judges sat in a circle round him. In the year 1400, 10,000 members existed in Germany. People with a bad conscience suspected their own relations and friends. William of Brunswick is reported to have said on a certain occasion, if Duke Adolphus of Schleswig should pay me a visit, I must infallibly hang him, as I do not wish to be hanged. Frederick of Brunswick, a prince of the same family, who was emperor for a moment, refused to obey a citation of the free judges, and from that time forward he went armed from head to foot and surrounded by guards. One day, however, he fell a little apart from his suite and had occasion to loosen some part of his armor. He did not return and his guards entered the copse where he had sought retirement for a moment. The unfortunate man was in the act of expiring, with the dagger of the holy Vem in his body and his sentence attached to the weapon. Looking round in all directions, they could distinguish a masked man retreating at a slow pace, but no one dared to follow him. The code of the Vemic court was found in the ancient archives of Westphalia and has been printed in the Reichsteter of Muller, under the following title, Code and Statutes of the Holy Secret Tribunal of Free Counts and Free Judges of Westphalia, Established in the year 772 by the Emperor Charlemagne and revised in 1404 by King Robert, who made those alterations and additions requisite for the administration of justice in the tribunals of the illuminated, after investing them with his own authority. A note on the first page forbade any profane person to glance at the book under penalty of death. The word illuminated, here given to the associates of the secret tribunal, unfolds their entire mission. They had to track down in the shadows those who worshipped the darkness. They counterchecked mysteriously those who conspired against society in favor of mystery. But they were themselves the secret soldiers of light, who cast the light of day on criminal plottings, and it is this which was signified by a sudden splendor illuminating the tribunal when it pronounced sentence. The public provisions of the law under Charlemagne authorized this holy war against the tyrants of the night. The records may be consulted to ascertain the penalties inflicted on sorcerers, diviners, enchanters, knowers diagulet, and those who administered poison in the guise of love filters. The same laws made it penal to trouble the air, raise tempests, construct characters and talismans, cast lots, practice witchcraft and magical charms, whether on men or cattle. Sorcerers, astrologers, diviners, necromancers, occult mathematicians are declared execrable and made subject to punishment in the same way as thieves and assassins. Such severity will be understood by recalling all that has been said on the horrible rites of black magic and its infant sacrifices. The danger must have been grave indeed when its repression assumed forms at once so severe and numerous. Another institution which is referable to the same root was that of knight errantry. The knights errant were a species of free judges who appealed to God and their spears against all the oppressions of Castellans and all the malice of necromancers. They were armed missionaries, who protected themselves with the sign of the cross and then clove miscreants asunder. After such manner did they earn the remembrance of some noble dame, sanctifying love by the martyrdom of a life which was one of utter self-devotion. We are far removed already from those pagan courtesans to whom slaves were offered in sacrifice and for whom the conquerors of the ancient world burnt cities. For the ladies of Christendom other sacrifices were requisite. Life must have been risked in the cause of the weak and oppressed. Captives must have been set free. Punishment meted out to the profaners of holy affections. And then those lovely and white ladies, whose skirts were embroidered with heraldic badges, whose hands were pale and delicate, those living Madonnas, proud as lilies who came back from church, with books of hours under their arms and rosaries at their girdles, 
would remove a veil broidered with gold or silver and give it as a scarf to the knight who knelt before them, praying to them and dreaming of God. Let us forget Eve and her errors. They are forgiven a thousand times, and are more than atoned for by this ineffable grace of the noble daughters of Mary.